Hi, ma'am. Uh, my name is Jyotsna. I'm media representative of Frontless Media. Today we have uh, Krish uh, Kavita Krishnan with us. Kavita Krishnan uh, is a secretary of All India Progressive Women's Association. She is a member of Poly, uh, the Poly Politburo uh, Communist Party and all uh, Politburo, and also the editor of its monthly publication, Liberation. She is a, a women right activist and has been working for the problem which is against from the women. So uh, welcome Kavita ma'am. So happy to have you on board today. Hi. Um, I'm very glad that you have me also. Let me just uh, clarify a little bit. I'm the uh, Politburo member of the Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist, which is a spotty CPIML for short. And that's right, I'm a secretary of the All India Progressive Women's Association, which is in a women's organization, uh, left uh, oriented women's organization in India. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, ma'am, uh, our audience would like to know who is Kavita Krishnan as a real person, actually, who you are. Well, um, I have, was born in uh, Tamil Nadu in a town called Kunu. That's in the Nilgiris district, and I um, I was brought up in Bilai, which is a steel township uh, where there's a steel plant, um, and uh, that's where I went to school in one of the steel plant schools and so on. And um, I think that you know, as a as a young person in school and so on, I was probably an more of an instinctive uh, feminist, but did not really have any other politics as such. Very little, probably. Um, but after when I came to college in Bombay, I did my BA from uh, St. Xavier's College. So that was a very formative period because that was between 1990 and 93. So that was when the anti-Muslim uh, riots took place, violence took place in um, Mumbai following the demolition of the Babri Masjid and all of that. So uh, I think all that had a very big impact on me and the rise of um, uh, Hindu supremacist forces and uh, the threat that represented to women's rights. That was something which was, uh, you know, something I felt very much in those years. But it was properly only after I came to Jawaharlal Nehru University as an MA student that I really started getting involved in activism. Okay. So that was with the All India Students Association. And uh, that's where I was elected to the JNU Students Union also as a joint secretary. And uh, I became part of several people's movements then, um, you know, as a student, you feel that you have to give back to society, okay. you know, because in a sense, uh, education is a privilege, it should not be, it should be right, but it is the privilege in a country like India. So you keep feeling that that social commitment is also important uh, if you are studying. So um, that's how I got more involved in activism. And I joined the Communist Party of India Marxist Leninist and also, of course, the women's movement. Question to you, Fearless Freedom book, which is reflect the predicament of the women in our society. So what is the exact meaning of the Fearless Freedom to you? And how do you, uh, how did you come up with the idea of this book? Um, this book, you know, that I've written, which is uh, the only book that uh, is by my name uh, as of now, it was published by Penguin last year. This is uh, basically, this is not uh, just about uh, the predicament of Indian women. I think it was an intervention in a long-standing conversation and several other books and writings by other people about uh, Indian women and violence against women. So I think everyone accepts all over the world that violence against women is a big problem in India, right? So they will say, oh, rape is a huge issue in India. Indian media also, if they ever talk about violence, it will only be about rape. And then also it will only be about some rape cases, certain specific cases. So I think that, uh, and I was very active. Uh, I've been active, as I said, in the women's movement for uh, several decades. So in 2012, when the, um, you know, when the, Delhi gang rape in the bus happened and there was a movement against that. Um, I was part of that and I think that for several months before that, several years before that, I had been uh, very frustrated by the idea of how we talk about sexual violence and violence in general uh, or violence against women in general, you know. So the thing is that uh, in India, so I'd been feeling that, um, you know, you talk about rape and you, ex you think that 
we as feminists, when we say rape, we mean the violation of uh, consent. So a woman, oh. you are you are uh, you are making sexual contact with a woman, although she has she does not say yes. Okay. So, um, but in popular understanding, if you say okay. rape uh, on the street to someone, the high chances in India are that they see rape as being something which is a un uh, you know uh, something socially unacceptable sexual relation with a woman so it does not matter whether the woman has agreed to that relation or not they will say are balatkar ho gaya and ah. izzat lo gaya so the point is because you are connecting it with izzat and all of that the izzat is something which the woman does not control so it is not her dignity it is a communal community sense of honor okay so that's a patriarchal sense so what would happen is that if a woman yeah. has a relationship of her own choice also even that is considered mm -hmm. uh, you know her her lover will be accused of rape and so on and uh, she also will get you know, treated violently so um in 2012 during that movement i had spoke, given a speech outside shila dikshit's house in which i had reacted to a question by a journalist a well meant question where she had said that you know people uh, are saying that why did this woman go out at night but after all some women have to go out at night because they work and they are nurses but i had felt a sense of anger at that question and i had uh, given a speech in which i had basically described that i had said that look why do we have to justify that oh we were out at night because of this why do women have to produce an alibi to justify being out at night or out at any time of day or night why are you always uh, you know women in public spaces are, are in the name of our own safety we are being locked okay. up so i had said we are not asking for safety we are asking that you safeguard our freedom and our fearless freedom that we should not and fear of what not just fear of rape fear of being seen as a bad woman because we are out at this time or because we are out with someone or because we are out alone or whatever whatever there is no formula to be seen as a good woman okay doesn't matter what you're wearing or who you are with or whether you're alone or not right uh you are always being judged by a patriarchal lens which yeah. always finds you guilty you are always already guilty right so that is where i first used this phrase bekhauf azadi in the speech in hindi that uh, i had hindustani that i had given and um, and subsequently i we were also of course organizing around that idea and i had uh, elaborated on it so this book is basically um, inspired by that moment and what has followed since so it is thinking about what um, you know why um, um, you know the worst form of violence in india against women is not rape rape happens all over the world and it's very bad it's very bad in india but the point is it is not um, specific to india alone okay indian yeah. rape culture is not all that different from rape culture in other parts of the world and rape culture does not just mean rape but it also means you know the ways in which rape is justified the ways in which people make excuses for rapists the the ways in which people blame women for rape so that happens all over the world you've had protests against it you know the slut walk protests were because a policeman in canada said that this woman was acting like a slut and that is why she was raped so then you have you know similar comments in india all the time but i think what is specific to india and south asia more generally is the idea that um, is the violence that is conduct you know perpetrated against women against women's autonomy in the name of keeping them safe so the point is this violence goes you know it 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 is uh, hidden in open in the open so it is hmm. in the open but we don't see it as violence so if a family is restrict locking up their daughter because they do not want her to have a boyfriend from yeah. another caste or community we yeah. see it as protection we don't see it as violence our society does not see it as violence they see it as perfectly justified in protection and um, you know so that that is something i think that we need to uh, think about and we need to okay. that, that is what this book thinks about that is what this book is trying to think through yeah okay thank you so much ma'am okay so my next question to you every woman has faced such a restriction in their lives and they all are being told by others that every time to be safe and you know be protect yourself so have you ever felt any such confinement that makes you question your identity as identity as a woman 
I think all of us have done that, haven't we? Because we have, uh, even if we, you know, many of us face it at home, of course, but even if you don't face it at home, you face it in hostels, you face it everywhere, right? Where the curfew hours are different for women, they are different for boys, they are different for women students, okay. they're different for male students. So hostel curfew hours will be 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. for women students, whereas for men students, there may be no curfew at all, or the curfew may be 11 o'clock at night or something, right? So the idea that uh, somehow, uh, and if you argue against it, they'll say, oh, it's over your own protection and all of that. And uh, I think that is something we all very commonly experience and we experience it as a restriction on our um, right to, you know, uh, experience the world around us, to experience the city we are living in, uh, to take risks, okay? Because after all, you know, you are doing all this to women as though women do, are not concerned for their safety. Of course, every woman is perpetually obsessed, haunted by the idea of her safety. We all strategize for our safety. You don't have to tell women that, oh, you know, you don't know how to keep yourself. You're not worried about your safety. We are. Of course, yeah. she's worried about her safety. We are always trying to calculate, you know, um, way what can we do to keep ourselves more safe, right? But yeah. the f fact is that it is wrong and in public spaces on transport, all of this, I mean, it's, it's, we, are, we are continuously, um, you know, worrying about how to keep ourselves safe. But the point is that uh, I think what we all recognize as women is that we are not necessarily more unsafe in public spaces. Rather, you know, even a Delhi High Court judgment recognized that women are far, are most likely to be killed inside their own homes rather than anywhere else. On this is a case all over the world. This is not again not just India, but yeah. the, so you know. So the domestic spaces uh, and a person who knows you, a family member or a lover or a uh, uh, you know uh, husband, is most likely to be the person who kills a woman. So uh, clearly, then what is this that you know? So our conversation is completely skewed because we are mm. talking only about stranger rape, and we are obsessed with death penalty, death penalty, death penalty. Uh, we do not realize that that is a distraction. Death penalty talk is a distraction because the point is uh, we should be connecting stranger rape as well as rape by people who are known. We should be seeing the full picture and connecting mm. all the dots, right? We should be understanding the relationship between domestic violence and sexual violence, sexual violence by people we know and sexual violence by strangers and, yeah. um, you know, uh, uh, attacks on women's autonomy. How do we understand rape, rape culture, all of this? We don't really do that. So, uh, and our media and all actively try to prevent us from doing this, from mm -hmm. achieving this understanding. So if I'm speaking on a TV channel about a, one particular instance of rape where the accused have been killed by the police, like in Telangana. So I try to say that, look, I try to point out this, that look, this mm -hmm. is not an, the answer. In fact, you don't even know whether those four guys were actually the guilty or not. The police killed four people because mm. they were ashamed because they had not acted to rescue the woman when she was alive. They did not take the parents' complaint seriously in Telangana, the Disha case. But the point is, you okay. uh, you know, so they, they killed it and we're all ha, consuming this and saying, very good, very good, justice is done. No, justice mm -hmm. is not done. And the point is that I tried to say this about uh, violence against women in private spaces. And immediately the anchor stopped me and said, no, 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 you only have to talk about this case and you only have to talk about the death penalty. So I said, but you're restricting the conversation to something which is a non-issue. This is not the issue we should be talking about. Yeah. If you're talking about sexual violence and violence against women, you have to talk about a whole lot of other things. And what is producing this violence daily and what is sustaining it? You're not letting me talk about my experience as an actor. You're not, it, you, know, you are actively preventing me from talking about my experiences on the ground and what I think are the important things to talk about. And you are forcing me to talk about something which is a non-issue, which the state is setting the agenda. Uh, the same government which has failed women is setting the agenda. The media which is least concerned about women and the anchors who know nothing about women are setting the agenda. They're not bothering to listen to uh, those who have more experience on this, right? So this is basically what uh, I, had, uh, I have felt. And uh, I think in today's world, it's all the more important to think about these things because um look at what is happening in our country and in our neighborhood yeah. so when i wrote this book that was last year so this is about women's freedom this is about women's autonomy and this is about the 
you know the kap panchayats who say we won't we will kill you if you decide to marry uh, in oh, inside the same inside the same gotra or outside the caste mm -hmm. there are these uh, hindu supremacist vigilante groups who say if you're a hindu who's in love with a muslim then you're a victim of love jihad you say are hello i am not a victim of anything i am in love with this guy i want to marry him no 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 you're a victim and we're yeah. going to rescue you so we're going to yeah. kidnap you and we're going to call it rescue all this is happening there is this um, obscene violence we see these obscene scenes of violence where this woman uh, she is being beaten up by her family and stripped naked and beaten you know recently in madhya pradesh there was a scene like that these scenes mm -hmm. of violence are increasing and increasingly i think the outrage against it is reducing because you have a politics in india now that basically is empowering lynching that is saying it's okay to yeah. kill people that you disagree with who's uh, you know if someone eats beef you can kill them if someone dresses in a way you don't like if she's a woman then you can call her a slut and you can kill her you can say she's a witch and you can kill uh, her yeah. you can say so there's more acceptance for uh, the enforcing of social norms that are barbaric that are wrong norms so there is no you know earlier in india of course these things were happening but there was also uh, much more acceptance for a movements that tried to uh establish uh, better social norms yes. in society right so feminist movements uh, did not face as much hostility as they do today whereas um, and you look at what is going to you know if this goes on where are we going to head we don't have to look far for that you turn your eyes and you see that afghanistan mm -hmm. with the taliban take over today where the taliban is going around uh, you know uh, beating up women uh, telling them what to how to dress telling them you can't work anymore telling them you can't study anymore uh, forcing them to marry uh, you know whoever mm. they dictate all of this pushing towards sex slavery yeah so in the name of religion uh, if somebody is going to rule and i don't consider them to be good muslims i think yeah. that they are they are only using uh, muslims or islam as a uh as a political tool and what it is proved by the fact that most of the people who are fleeing afghanistan today are muslims hmm. they are muslims who are running away from afghanistan right in plain bhar bhar kar ke they are the ones who are running away so in india you know um, ambedkar had once uh, written that in india hindu raj would be uh, uh, truly a uh, the worst nightmare for india this is what he meant that hindu supremacist raj you know the kind of uh, good mean a subjugation of women the slavery of women the slavery of dalits the slavery of muslims this does not mean that you know before 2014 before modi government came to power women and dalits and muslims were all very free and happy no but the no. point is that you could you knew that they were not uh, totally free and achieving a full of freedom for them had far greater acceptance you did were in lesser risk of being clapped in jail uh, under uapa called a terrorist because you are running a struggle for equal citizenship or for equal mm. rights right so i think these are some of the things that i uh, have written about in my book and i have tried to take people to a variety of places in this book so it is not just a book about delhi it's a book about uh, many places it's a book about uh, rural india it is a book about Uh, rural bihar and up it is a book about uh, it takes you to kashmir it takes you to manipur it takes you to kerala it takes you to uh, bastar in chatisgarh and it asks you to imagine what it is uh, you know what is it that is actually actively uh, a hurdle to mm -hmm. women's freedom in these specific places so in somewhere like kashmir or bastar it is the india indian mm -hmm. paramilitary and military which is creating uh, the greatest mm -hmm. threat to the security and uh, freedom of women uh, they they fear their lives are regimented and scared because of this so i've written about some of this i've described my encounters with some of the women in these areas and all of this yeah okay. thank you you just persuade me to read this book and i will definitely read this book yeah. because actually every city jo mein every woman know what is happening in our country so definitely yeah. i will read this book so my third question to you how long did you take to complete this book because there must have been a lot of research and drafting process so right so i um, you know i i think i submitted the uh, abstract for this book in 2019 and i thought that it would be over no in 2018 and i thought that it would be over pretty quick uh, within a few months but um, the thing is that i wrote 
quote when i sat down to write then i would end up writing maybe three chapters in at one go or two chapters at one go but the problem was that there was a lot of interruption in between because uh, i am mm -hmm. an activist and uh, you know things happen in the world which require me <laughs> to be giving more time there so i think the time uh, i underestimated the time it would take to actually write and the thing is that when you're writing something then after you write there is also a painstaking process of um fact checking making sure that hmm. each of each thing that you have said is very specifically worded that it is not worded in a way that uh, is misleading uh, and you have to make sure that every claim is backed by facts uh, if something is not a fact but an opinion it should not claim to be a fact it should make it clear that this is an opinion based on these these facts mm -hmm. etc so all that process also took quite a long while and in fact uh, the last period the last few months before publication was crazy because at that time the movement against the citizenship amendment act and the nrc npr was going on i was traveling widely uh, in uh, rural okay. india campaigning against these uh, laws and especially campaigning among um, non muslim communities because they had not uh, really recognized the the need to fight this law so i was uh, doing all this campaigning and in the midst of it i was getting proofs from penguin saying you know you are overdue and you have to check these proofs and send it back and everything so frankly i could do all that only with the help of my friends and uh, somehow managed to give it in on time so my fourth question to you how did you start your journey of being a woman activist and who persuaded uh, persuaded you to work for the women's welfare so um, how it happened everything yeah. from the beginning i was a student actually at the jnu as i said and before that of course i think i was a feminist by uh, by by instinct but i did not really uh, you know uh, have any experience of activism or of persuading other people uh, but in jnu you know i became an activist and i was an activist in in an organization where we had a lot of uh, women leaders and a lot of uh, freedom to basically so while it was a marxist organization a left organization it it also had a lot of space for feminist activism and feminist conversations and uh, there were a lot of my comrades who were convinced that uh, to be a marxist is to be a feminist you can't be a marxist if you're not a feminist so i became active in that but my activism was first you know it was mainly in the campus in jnu in, in delhi but subsequently um, there were you know i i i was introduced to uh, other comrades who were working in rural areas especially in rural bihar women were organizing and fighting for their rights as women as dalit women um in the face of very very real very terrible oppression and so on so i learned a lot from activists okay. like that i learned a lot from women working on the ground there and i generally felt uh, happy you know continuing to do that continuing to be an activist um and i think that it's become more and more urgent you know the sense of urgency i felt when i first started raising these issues as a student was because i felt that these are uh, freedoms that everybody should take for granted but we can't take it for granted because mm -hmm. not only in everyday life is our freedom threatened by hostel wardens or by our family members or by anybody but also the fact that um, there is an entire politics that uh, tries mm -hmm. to so it is not just that you are against up against some social prejudice which you can fight yeah. parents ke sath koi bhi thoda argue kar le sakte hain and we yeah. all have our strategies of persuading our parents but i think it was not just that mm -hmm. it you are up against uh, a very violent politics that uh, is conducted in the name of nationalism but is actually hindu supremacy which is uh, threatening the violence of women hindu especially hindu women it's not hinduism i mean it is a in politics being done in the name of hindu supremacy hindu supremacy means india hmm. does not belong to hindu muslim sikh isai it belongs primarily to hindus and the others can live there only if they say ki ha hmm. sarkar hindus are hamari mai baap hai hindus are you know bigger than us and that goes especially for women uh, so it is a really really uh, uh, terrifying prospect and as i said the taliban take over in afghanistan should not make us feel are hmm. we are very good in india hamare yahan to sab acha hai because hum hindu hai sorry you know ek to hum sare hindu nahi hai nee. and all societies are patriarchal societies the point is that 
in india a muslim or a sikh community or a christian community or a parsi community even while it is patriar patriarchal because it is a smaller community it cannot pretend to be nationalist whereas mm. the hindu community because it is in a majority it is more it's it's patriarchy and its communalism is more dangerous because it can pretend to be nationalism it can mm. say aapko majority ke hain this is indian culture because we are the majority that is what the taliban is doing in afghanistan whereas that is not true right uh so that is i think uh, what uh, you know looking at afghanistan instead of saying oh you know hinduism is so much better than islam or india is so much better than afghanistan or pakistan we should be saying if we don't wake up at least now bahut der ho chuka hai we are already very late yeah. the rss is already in power they are already mm -hmm. passing laws against so called love jihad they are already locking up women for fighting for their rights so if we hmm. don't wake up now then it will be too late tomorrow and we will be in the situation that we are witnessing in afghanistan now so if we want to prevent that we need to fight against our you know the bigots who are in power in our country that should be the correct lesson from what we see in afghanistan and of course we should open our doors and our hearts to the afghan people who are trying to flee um, uh, from the afghanistan the taliban over there yeah absolutely that is amazing uh okay so my fifth question to you i guess this is your debut book like this is your first time that you have written a book so how was your first writing experience or writing a book and have you faced any challenges um because I'm... it molded you yeah it as an author as in a writer yeah so okay. you know uh, saying the pen is mightier than sword so did this the, this is kind of you yeah. did this book of through your book yeah i i don't know about that pen mightier than sword thing because swords tend to kill those who wield the pen but i learned to write uh, you know uh, under in the course of activism in uh, jnu so i used to write leaflets and so on and you would be writing mm -hmm. uh, alongside your when you are writing your academic articles also academic um, essays mm -hmm. also uh you would be writing not just in your library or in your room but you're also writing and in those days i would not use a computer i did computers were not laptops were not common so in the early in the 90s you know till 2000 i did not use a laptop or a computer so i would write by hand and mm -hmm. my writing is pretty bad so i would have to learn to write clearly so that uh, somebody else can see it and type properly so all the editing also would have to be done on the same page and done neatly and it would and you would have to write you didn't write just when the fancy took you you wrote in a disciplined way you wrote because yeah. you had to write because uh, there is some debate today there is something that has happened today and you have to react and respond to it today so uh, that discipline that mm. political discipline uh, that shaped my writing a lot and i still do try to whether i'm writing uh, whether i'm speaking at an um, you know at a at a seminar or whether i'm at an academic seminar or whether i'm speaking on the street whether i'm writing a leaflet or whether i'm writing a book um or an academic uh, essay um, my writing style doesn't differ very much and i try to keep it as i don't dumb down things when i'm writing uh, you know for uh, popular consumption uh, rather i try to um, communicate the same ideas no matter how complex and how contradictory or how difficult they may be but i try to communicate in okay. a language that is as straightforward and simple as possible so i keep asking myself you know would oh. a 10 year old would a 10 year old or a 12 year old be able to understand what i'm saying i try to speak like that uh, whether i'm speaking in english or hindi i try to speak and write clearly i know that that is not uh, in english particularly that is not easy for me to achieve uh, i don't think that um, most of us in india don't write although i i i speak english very fluently and i've always grown up reading it and all of that but i don't think um, i find that you know uh, when i see the writing of people in uh, uh, say say an uh, british author i find the language to be much more clear and much more communicative and much more transparent than my own writer mm. even an american writer so i sometimes uh, i'm dissatisfied if you ask me i'm not very <laughs> satisfied with my writing because i still feel that even now it is uh, I, i that i i cram it too much with too many things i try to say too many things in one book or one thing and probably uh, you know there is some better way to communicate but i'll keep trying <laughs> i'll keep trying to write better better things right be consistent okay. so basically uh, you wrote 
for the for everyone like from yeah. 12 to 60 age and on okay yeah, any age at all yeah. so my last question to you so according to you, what is the meaning of safety for women and throughout your career span have you seen any drastic changes for the safety of women in india so i think that you know what we what we should uh, we, i think we need a very strong shift in focus on okay. what we need to be demanding i think we should completely drop uh, the debate you know it's no longer a debate it is a settled issue that death penalty and castration and god knows what though, that stuff does not help that is deeply anti women anti feminist and it is a complete distraction from what we need to be talking about mm. so rather than focusing on only on punishment and that to on severity of punishment we should be talking about a uh, process and we should be talking about uh, making um, you know making ordinary life for women full of justice and full of we should make sure that justice is a lived reality and not an exception how to do that Okay. so uh, i think that one of the things is uh, let me let me share something with you about how what we think keeps uh, women safe or girls okay. safe actually makes them much more unsafe so the point is because parents restrict their uh, daughters so much in the name of safety mm-hmm. so they are so reluctant to send their daughters out of the city to study you know out of their home to study mm-hmm. so the minute there is some news of uh, violence or something they'll say nahi nahi beta wapas bula lete hain we'll keep we'll bring you back we don't want you to study mm-hmm. outside please come back you know study where we tell you to study study close by home live at home just go to college and then we'll pick you up we'll drop you at college we'll pick you up and bring you back so no time hanging around with mm-hmm. your friends no time to go anywhere we want to keep an eye okay. on you and with see what happens because of that what is the result of that it's not just you know something funny that we deal with although it is used as a joke very often i see so many advertisements joking about the protective brother or the protective yeah. father ki boyfriend ko lekar ke main marunga ki nahi no sorry that all of that actually what is the result on women the impact on girls and women is that when they actually face violence um i know several young in my, in the course of my activism um i think the number one reason why uh, girls and women are reluctant to complain when they face violence is that they fear the consequences they hmm. think that their parents their loving parents or their loving brother or whoever the you know authority is in their family they are immediately going to curtail their education cut their life and lock them back into the house and whatever little freedom that they have achieved you know hmm. uh, is going to immediately disappear and that is why they don't complain so the point is they are facing hmm. violence or continuing to suffer violence because they are afraid of what their family members will do uh, to their freedom so hmm. i think instead of focusing on you know the sh- you know this this awful like violence uh, sexual violence is the worst thing that can ever happen you should be saying that no you should be assuring your daughters that sexual violence is a horrible thing because it's not your fault because someone else has violated your autonomy hmm. and you could not have done anything to pr- prevent it hmm. your learning karate or martial arts or anything is not going to make you safer yeah. you may do all that and you may still not be safe okay because you may be a wonderful karateka but that does not protect you against a boyfriend who is uh, uh forcing you or manipulating you into uh, on a date or who is giving you a date rape drug and, and raping you or against a teacher who is able to you know uh, influence you and even bhai karate seekhte hain lekin agar karate teacher hi agar uh, sexually abuse kar raha hai bacche ko what to do so the point is this focus on physical physical you know protection and physical violence as a solution to everything it is not true rather we should be assuring our daughters and assuring girls and women that it is never your fault and any time you must feel free to come and tell us that somebody has done this the fault is never yours we will never make you suffer for it mm. you will never lose an ounce of your freedom because you complained about violence rather we will support you unquestioningly in your struggle for justice mm-hmm. uh that is a gift that we can give our people and i don't mean only women i want to also add here that sexual violence boys suffer sexual violence and they find it very difficult to talk about it young boys because it is considered unmasculine uh, to be uh, to have been raped or to have been abused right not only that uh, lgbtq people suffer 
sexual violence and uh, there is again very little conversation around this and there is no justice for lgbtq people because very often mm. their own families their own parents do not accept them so the yeah. gift of acceptance the gift of unquestioning acceptance the gift of saying that uh, you know we will respect what you are we will respect your experience we will never blame you we will never ask you to change who you are and um, we in the name of protecting you you know i may be terribly worried about your safety but i will not curtail i know that you are also concerned about your own safety mm -hmm. so i won't try to you know even if i am a husband or a boyfriend who loves you okay i will not tell you that in the name of your for your safety i have to know 24/7 you know through an app or whatever i have to stalk you 24/7 no i know that you are concerned also and you will ask for my help if you ever need anything i will not tell you that nahi mujhe nazar rakhna hai 24 ghanta on you uh, so that i can tell you yahan kyun gaye wahan kyun gaye this was unsafe that was unsafe no you know don't do this policing you know and collectively as a society we have to work against any ideologies that behave like these you know this khap panchayat behavior towards people where communities behave like they own women mm -hmm. so we are not the property of any community if i am a hindu i am not a property of the hindu community if yeah. i am a particular caste i am not a property of that caste okay. i happen to be born in that caste but i hate the caste system i don't want to be part, i don't want to be ruled by the rules of this uh, uh, you know disgusting system somebody uh, has created and forced uh, on this society okay i i want to fight against it i do not want uh, if i am a muslim i don't belong to the muslim community they are not they don't own me okay mm. so the point is this business ki nahi wo agar usne love kar diya kisi aur community ke kisi se to the other banda has stolen her from our community mm -hmm. See, that is not the way this uh, you know stop treating us like property that is how the taliban behaves that yeah. is how the sangh parivar behaves in india and no we do not want such people in power we should stop voting for them we need to recognize that this is not going to uh, this is not going to help us and hmm. uh, we need to fight back against this yeah i am amazed and because i am so glad that you know just hearing you or just you know no getting to know much more information about society it's kind of very inspirational to me and uh, i i don't have any words i'm just speechless right now you know uh, i'm so young and you are so you know experienced and i'm really really glad that i took interview because this is very informational to me and very inspirational and i hope we need people like you in our society to bring a change and thank you so much ma'am uh, we had a great interview with you i really enjoyed the conversation thank you so thank much thank you so much ma'am have a good day ma'am okay thank you